But when you put out love and grace and gratitude and kindness, it becomes who you are. And then you truly are beautiful if you're kind and uh, compassionate and loyal and loving and self-accepting. Welcome to the Woman's Doctor Podcast, helping empower women to embrace their body and soul's full potential. I'm your host, Dr. Trevor Cates, and after 22 years of working with patients, I found the answers to our health struggles are much deeper than most people realize. To help explore this, I'm interviewing colleagues and other wellness experts to get to the root cause so women can realize their true beauty and be informed decision makers for themselves and their loved ones. Did you know that having regular sex around three times per week can make you look up to 10 years younger? Well, today's guest definitely looks more than 10 years younger than her age. And her secret? Well, she gives one of those away right at the beginning of the interview. You probably know Suzanne Summers from TV shows like Three's Company, or maybe her Thigh Master, or from one of her number one New York Times bestselling books like Ageless, Bombshell, and Sexy Forever, or one of her other many bestselling books. While Suzanne is not a doctor, she's interviewed many doctors about integrative medicine treatments and covers these in her books. And with all the research she's shared, it's helped many women, including doctors. When I was interviewing experts for my Hormones, Health, and Harmony docuseries, three different gynecologists told me that reading Suzanne Summers' books changed their own health, as well as their practice helping other women shifting them to a more functional medicine approach. In today's podcast, Suzanne shares how to get you back and how to look younger with age. So please enjoy her bits of wisdom in this episode of the Woman's Doctor podcast. So you can tell your friends that, yes, I am having sex a lot. I was on that show, The Talk, and uh, what's her name? Carney Wilson said to me, how often do you and your husband have sex? And she said, if you say more than twice a week, I'll kill myself. And I said, no, no, no. I said, we have sex once or twice a day. (laughs) 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 And I said it for effect because, of course, it's not every day, but it's often. And I want women and men to know that it ain't over, that now that we've got the life extension with quality of life, Kind of a perfect scenario. Imagine living well into your 90s, 100, and uh, being all that you are right now. I mean, that's kind of an exciting thing. And you know where I am seeing the, the, the biggest disparity is the 50-year-old women who come up to me and they're not on hormones. And I can tell right away that, you know, 50 is young. 50 is a fantastic age. But if you're uh, lacking in hormones, um, you look tired, you look kind of washed out, you're starting to gain a little weight, not very interested in sex. And like I said at the beginning of the interview, I believe that uh, hormone loss is responsible for so many divorces because when you're completely uh, out of your hormones, which I call the juice of youth, you're not fun to live with. You don't even like living with yourself. And so This is my little part that I'm doing for humanity. Let's keep us together and keep us in love. (laughs) The the only thing that really matters is love. I was in the hospital uh, 10 years ago. I had been poisoned deliberately. It's a long story. I won't go into it. I wrote about it in my book, Knockout. And they had diagnosed me with, there's so so much cancer in your body, we we, 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 we can't count the tumors. There's so many tumors. And um, they wanted to do a, a surgery, to t- a biopsy. And I would already kind of thought, if I've got so much cancer in me, I, I, I don't have much of a chance. It was the first time I kind of let down. And uh, that night before the surgery, I heard a voice. I hear voices. And um, my husband was in my little hospital bed with me. And he wasn't hearing it. And my children were asleep at the foot of the bed and they weren't hearing it. And it sounded like a microphone (laughs) like that. And then the voice said, it's not who you are. It's not what you do. It's not what you have. It's only about who you love and who loves you. Where'd that come from? 
we know. And um, I use that at the end of my show because when profound words come to you like that, that aren't yours, that you didn't think up, it made so much sense to me. Yeah, that's all that's important. Uh, no matter what happens, rather than look at how bad it is, look at how lucky you are to have what you have. Focus on what you have and not what you don't have. So um, that I digressed a little bit and I didn't have cancer. Thank God we did the biopsy. They came to me after and said, you don't have any cancer anywhere. So I went through that whole scare for 10 days and contemplating if this is the end, what do I want the end to be? And maybe that was the gift. I, I appreciate every day from here on in. I, um, I wake up every morning just feeling so blessed that I am so loved and that I love so deeply. And um, I think every negative is a positive if you choose to look at it that way. We are sent lessons all the time. And um, I've sure been sent mine. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Feel like every day is a miracle. Absolutely. And it's I, a great know, way to think about it. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's partly why I want to do this docu-series too, to help inspire other women. And so I appreciate you sharing all of this and you you know, you learned a lot over the years. If you could go back in time to your 21, to like your 2021, 20, early 20 self, what would you want to share with her? Oh, that was such a hard time in my life. I was a child of an alcoholic. That's what started me in my writing career. I had a violent alcoholic father and we spent more nights hiding in the closet to uh, hide from the monster than sleeping in our own beds. And what's interesting is how normal uh, it becomes. I just, that's just what our life was. And then I got pregnant as a teenager and the first time I ever had sex. And so in my early twenties, I was a single, really young mother with no skills emotionally, uh, other than I was going to give my son a better life than what I had had. And what I would tell myself, what this self would tell that self back then is um, learn to love yourself and look at the part you're playing in every drama of your life. What part did you play in it? And I'm thinking, now, well, what part did I play in my father being an alcoholic? The part I played was I, I believed all the negativity he uh, would hurl at me. You're stupid, you're hopeless, you're nothing, you're a big O. Um, I believed that. And then I did this high school play. And um, I, I was Adelaide in Guys and Dolls. If anyone's Adelaide, it's me. And I that, that part, I just morphed into it. And Damon Runyon had written uh, Guys and Dolls, and he fashioned one of the uh, Nathan Detroit characters off of a famous uh, columnist at that time, Walter Winchell. What is this about? Walter Winchell came to the last performance of my high school play. How? I don't know. Why? I don't know. And at the end, the drama teacher introduced Walter Winchell, and he came, he had a, a, an outfit. A, a trench coat and a pork pie hat. He walks up on stage and went right to me. And he said, you're going someplace, sister. Now, I, I was thrilled, but I didn't see really the what that really meant until years later. And that's what got me my part on Three's Company. I had no training when I started Three's Company, but I once had a part where I was, uh, that I owned it. And I th think for people who watched me as Chrissy Snow on Three's Company saw that I owned the character of Chrissy Snow. I made her up. I made her the child that I never got to be. And Jack and Janet were the parents. And in that little dumb apartment that we lived in was, I felt safe. I made that character feel safe because I wasn't safe growing up. So I would go back and tell her then, this is not your fault. See the part you're playing in it. Uh, uh, do the work you need to do to get to the place where you can love who you are. And I now do. I love who I am. I wouldn't trade me at all. I was having a conversation with God the other day. And I said, I'm sorry I had low self-esteem for so many years. Because here I am, your creation. 
and you did a great job with me. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> it's amazing, right? I mean, it's, if we can yeah. remember that, that yeah, um, yeah, beautiful. It's creation. hard when you're young. You don't have the ability. You don't have the one thing that young people can't buy or have that I now have the beginnings of, which is perspective. That's being able to float above you and the life you live and see uh, comparatively, you know, like, ah, yes, I remember that. Uh, and you watch other people and you go, you're just wasting time being so angry and you're wasting time being a victim. Your anger allows the person who made you angry uh, make you the victim. And until you can forgive, and that was the biggest thing that ever happened for me was the uh, able to forgive my father. And he did not grow up wanting to abuse his wife and children. Uh, he had a terrible disease and it made him do terrible things. And um, I insisted at one point that he apologized to me. I said, if anybody ever treated my mother or me the way you treated us, I would kill them. And uh, he wrote me this long letter the letter that a daughter would want to get. Well, there's nothing more healing in life than a true heartfelt apology. And so many people have such a hard time uh, apologizing. When Al and I first got married, we'd fight a lot because we didn't know what we were fighting about. And I'd say, can't you just say you're sorry? You go, okay, I'm sorry. And I go, no, 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 that's not the right way. Oh, you got I have to say it the way you want me to say it. Now uh, we don't fight anymore, but if there's something, he'll, he, he says he's sorry before I even ask for it. And it's heartfelt. I didn't need to do that. And another therapist taught me how to argue. And I think your audience will find this interesting. If you start in an argument, a sentence with you always, you never, or you should, you back that person into a corner, like a cornered snake. And all a snake can do then is strike. But if you rather say, when you do that, whatever that is, it makes me feel this, whatever this is, it dissipates the, the uh, argument immediately. And the other person inevitably says, I didn't mean to do that. And then you move on in life. So world peace. Do you know when I was a little girl, five years old, and I would uh, had another closet that I hid in. I should write a book called In the Closet. <laughs> but I had another closet that you could crawl under the clothes and go way, way in the back where there was a place to put shoes. And I used to have this um, vivid uh, imagination. All we learned about when I was a kid was you got to fight communists. You got to fight communists. I didn't know what communism was or a communist was. But in my little girl mind, I would go to the top of the mountain where all the communists were. And I, my little girl self would say, why do you want to fight? And the communist guy would say, yeah, you're right. And I would create world peace. That was my <laughs> little powerful trip. It was the only thing I could control. If you think about it, I couldn't control anything else, but I could control that. Walk around going, I'm creating world peace. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, anyway, yes for you, your girlfriends. I am having sex at seventy-five <laughs> and loving it. Fantastic. And, oh, by the way, what the, what what women don't realize is when you lose your sex hormones—estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, pregnenolone—you um, can't feel sex. You, without sex hormones, you can't feel sex. You can involve your brain. You can tell your brain, "I'm in the mood," and um, the brain is quite powerful while you're waiting for hormones to kick in. But that's the other reason marriages break up at uh, midlife, because the, the woman just suddenly loses all interest in sex. And after a while, it, it, uh, it affects their, their bond. And um, uh, so just, I just want women to know that it may take time, but when you put the uh, hormones back, individualized like what you need is not what i need what i need is not what you need each one of us needs a little bit and it takes a while to finesse the sweet spot but when you find it uh it's so wonderful right <laughs> fantastic and and sex is actually healthy for us right yeah it was given to us for a reason to um uh you know, um, it, it's love and comfort and um, excitement, and um, it, it's you make makes you feel desirable. All these things are what makes us us. Yeah, absolutely. And 
you know, I know you mentioned this a little bit, but I think a lot of women are surprised at how early these changes in our hormones can happen and how their sex drive can drop. You mentioned being 50. um, I'm 49. And I, you know, so I, you know, closely as you were talking about, but but many women in their thirties even start right. experiencing these changes in their symptoms and they don't necessarily make the connection to it being perimenopause because they think they're too young. Right. That's what right. you were talking about earlier. Well, that's what we were talking about earlier mm-hmm. because this new crop of I'm going to be needing hormone replacement is much longer, younger than it ever was. It used to be 50, 55 by 50, 55. You're a mess if you're not on hormones. But in the 30s now, because of the environmental assault, which blunts hormone production, um, the environmental assault, which is making our wombs not the most desirable place for growing our babies anymore, um, uh, women need to be educated early on now that uh, it's coming or it's there. And rather than be embarrassed by it and push the thought away, embrace it. If I always tell women, you know, if you get this before you're fully drained out, you'll never have to experience any deleterious effects of hormone loss. And you don't want to experience hormone loss. It feels awful. And like I said earlier, it changes your personality. You you become not you. And that's why you've always heard those jerks, uh, jokes about, you know, older women and uh, menopausal and their moods. And um, it's, it's, it's no joke. You know, I wonder, when I was a kid, there was a series called Hazel. She was a maid and she was scatterbrained. When I realized all these years later was Hazel was in menopause. That's why she couldn't remember anything. And in many ways, so was Jean Stapleton as Edith on All in the Family. Jean Stapleton was all, you know, scatterbrained. And that's that's, um, called hormone loss. But you don't want to stay scatterbrained for too long because the brain... Uh, it gets fed by estrogen. Uh, one doctor told me that if you got a headache, take your estrogen cream and put it right here and get it right to the brain because the brain uh, requires estrogen. Uh, it's just so wonderful to be able to get you back. And I always tell women, you know, don't don't be afraid of it. Go 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 for it. And I mostly now am worried about the children. The they have been consuming and exposed to chemicals since birth now, and all the autism, and all the ADD, ADHD, OCD, um, all the gut problems with kids. We sell a lot of our gut renew to mothers who want it for their kids. And essentially what's in it is everything you and I haven't eaten today, you know, what's in there. Phyto greens, or, or plant-based uh, proteins, immune support boosters, gut health nutrients. Essentially, you put two spoons in a smoothie, make a smoothie out of this pattern. It's delicious. If the GI tract is the length of a tennis court, and around that tennis court, which is our barrier wall, is mucus, and that mucus is our immune system. So now that's how we protect our, our gut with our immune system. But when the chemicals get in, Uh, through the skin, through the air, or the food we eat, and they get into the GI tract, they eat through the barrier wall because the microbiome is off and leak out leaky gut into the bloodstream. And then it makes its way to the fattiest organs and glands, the fattiest being the, the brain. If that's happening to our kids right now who are experiencing bloating and, and diarrhea or constipation, one little girl in our family has just been constipated since birth. Um, two of my other grandchildren uh, have had such serious initial problem, ADD, ADHD, OCD. And I wonder how much cesarean plays into that because the, the most valuable trip we're going to take in our life, all of us, is that last final trip through our mother's vaginal canal. And our first breath or first swallow is not air or food. It's our mother's vaginal flora. And that's how we colonize our GI tract, which is brilliant. Nature is brilliant. But if you're born cesarean, you miss that. Now, if doctors are savvy to that, then immediately you flood that baby with the equivalent 
uh, probiotics that would have been in the mother's vaginal flora, but that didn't happen for my grandchildren. I think that is the reason, even though they eat, they grew up on organic food that they've had so many gut and brain issues. And um, going forward, we don't want to have a society of people with gut and brain issues. And of course, you know, the gut brain connection that uh, the immune system is connected to the brain. And um, it's all so important. I now know that the body requires uh, balance and alignment. It wants your body to be in alignment and it wants balance nutritionally, minerally, and hormonally. And when you find that balance and that right alignment through yoga or whatever form of exercise, you don't have to be, you know, a super athlete. You, uh, you just kind of settle into uh, life is good. Yeah. Alignment is a great word for all of that. Alignment yeah. Is important. Um, and, you know, I think when you think about kids, I, another thing I think about is the misconceptions that are around beauty and what it is to like grow up and be beautiful. I think with social media and television, there's a lot of mm. misunderstandings for, especially for young women, really women of all ages around beauty. What do you, where do you think real beauty comes from? Uh, the soul, but um, social media has made it, uh, uh, has put the emphasis on not how you look, but how can you manipulate the picture on the, on the screen so that you look 10, 20 times better than you actually look. And then there's, I heard a catchphrase last night for someone who, when somebody misrepresents what they really look like, and then they finally meet and it's like, Ooh, I didn't know that. Um, uh, you know, beauty is wonderful. If you've been given the gift of good looks as you, you have, and I have, um, the problem is it takes us a long time to recognize that we are that because we're just fraught with insecurity growing up, you're not enough. And I would imagine if you're interacting on you know, the social media sites every day that you're constantly comparing yourself to the next person and you'll never win if you compare yourself. So um, I was watching a show last night. There was a guy, Dwayne uh, Johnson, The Rock, who I, I, I've not, never seen any of his movies. I'm certainly aware of who he is. But he said, I heard something many, many years ago. It's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. And I thought, what you put out into the world is what comes back at you. You don't give to get. But when you put out love and grace and gratitude and kindness, uh, it, it becomes who you are. And then you truly are beautiful if you're kind and uh, compassionate and loyal and loving and self-accepting. But you have to live for a while to get to that place because when you're young, you just wish you looked like Jennifer Lopez. <laughs> well, Suzanne, with all of that in mind, when did you realize that you're beautiful? Um, and it's now, uh, uh, you know, at 75, you start seeing things in the mirror, you go, Hmm, what's that? Tried to do this whole thing naturally, but I, I became beautiful in my relationship with my husband. He just thinks I'm so beautiful mm -hmm. and I'd go, yeah, yeah. And then one day I thought, accept it. And then I thought. I've been given that gift. So uh, be grateful and enjoy it and use it well. And so because I have a louder voice and because when I walk out on a stage, I can be impactful, I'm uh, grateful for it. And um, I, I like who I, I really like myself. <laughs> <laughs> and that took work, but I'm there. I really am. Thank you for listening to the Woman's Doctor podcast. If you enjoyed the podcast, be sure to share it with the women in your life. And to learn all about balancing hormones, join us for the Hormones, Health, and Harmony docuseries at thewomansdoctor.com.